Welcome into the Big East Fall Sports Update. I'm Megan Caffrey, joined alongside my partner, John Fanta. We have a lot to look forward to in today's show, including a lot of interviews, Marquette's goalkeeper, Luis Barraza, as well as the duo from Butler Women's Soccer. And John, you were out at Butler this weekend. You were at Xavier first and then Butler. How was your trip? It was great, Megan. Awesome to get out to the Midwest. Temperature's cooling down. I was sitting there thinking <laughs> to myself, yeah, we've gone from summer to winter weather. Now the weather becomes, in terms of temperature that mm -hmm. is, the weather becomes a factor here in the home stretch of conference play. Really fun to get out to Xavier and Butler, Cintas Center, Hinkle Fieldhouse, two awesome facilities. And uh, was at the Butler Bowl yesterday, and we've got some interviews coming up with the dogs who once again are having a great season. We'll get up to those interviews in just a little bit, but John, let's get into our favorite part of the show, the top five plays. Yeah, let's do it. Top five from this past weekend. We are starting with Marquette and St. John's. The Golden Eagles put on a show. Lucas Sunason delivering the goal in a 4 nothing statement win. At number four, Xavier women's soccer midfielder Molly McLaughlin with the header. Xavier shuts out Marquette 3-0. Number three, Caitlin Farrell's done this so much in her career. Just another day in the office. Picking up the rebound. This is great awareness. She's right place, right time at Shaw Field. She delivers the goal, and the Hoyas continue their perfect Big East season. Checking in at number two forward, Zani Kajan delivers the goal for St. John's. They shut out the Pirates 2-0, and look at that, John. A rattler at ONT Carroll Field. Net number one, Akeem Ward can play defense and offense. What can't Akeem Ward do? Stepping up in crunch time, a big spot for Creighton, and the angle there looks impossible, but nothing is impossible for Akeem Ward and the Creighton Blue Jays, Megan, who seem to be unstoppable in conference play in both men's soccer mm -hmm. and volleyball. And get this, they're the only school in the country, top 10 in attendance in men's soccer and volleyball. How about that? How about the Blue Jays, huh? And when you're making goals like what Akeem Ward was making like, you can't help but be undefeated in Big East play. Let's stick with men's soccer right now. And after this past weekend, the top three teams in Big East men's soccer pulled away from the pack. Creighton, Providence, wins on the road, John, and then Georgetown, a double overtime thriller over Villanova at home. What stands out about this conference beyond the Blue Jays is the log jam there in fourth place. Mm -hmm. You've got Xavier, St. John's, and Marquette and the Musketeers and Golden Eagles about to square off this weekend in a pivotal match in Milwaukee. I am fascinated by this showdown because Marquette is a different team at Valley Fields. Wins over St. John's and Villanova, and now they're looking for it against Xavier. So the Golden Eagles, they had had a 400 plus minute scoreless drought snapped on Saturday because they just we're on a roll against the St. John's defense, which is typically pretty good. And you have to look at it this way as well. Coming into this weekend, the Golden Eagles have the story of momentum coming in. A 4-0 win. And then on the other side of the ball, Xavier's coming off of two straight losses on. But I think the biggest takeaway from their game against Creighton was how well their offense really did play. The Musketeers had an advantage in shots on goal, 7-6 to six over the Blue Jays. And John? Creighton's only given up two goals in Big East play this season. One was against Xavier. Creighton's defense has just been in lockdown mode throughout this entire campaign. And what impresses me the most is their resolve on the road. It doesn't matter where they're playing. These Jays, they put on a show no matter where they go. I'm always impressed by their back line. And this team, we said there was a fire lit under them from what happened last season. They came up short in their goal. Clearly, it's paying off in conference play. You saw them last season, and now you've see, you have had the opportunity to see them this season. What's been the biggest difference? The biggest difference for me is they are definitely uh, better chemistry-wise. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could just sense it when you talk to the players that they mesh in a better way. And sometimes that's what it comes down to. Omar Balowicz has always had talent, but and he's gone to the NCAA tournament many times. I mean, they were on a streak of like 23 of the last 24 before last year. But for me, it comes down to can you mesh? They have the perfect mixture of defense. We see what Akeem Moore does with his back line to limit 
opposing offenses, but then you've got to come up with the timely goals, and they've done just that. And speaking of mesh and chemistry, I had the opportunity to sit down with Marquette's goalkeeper, Luis Barraza, and he mentioned the chemistry that he's been able to build with his back line this season. Welcome into the Big East Fall Sports Update Marquette goalkeeper and the Big East goalkeeper of the week, Luis Barraza. Luis, thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you guys for having me over. Saturday's 4-0 victory over St. John's marked your fourth shutout of the season. How have you been able to maintain that level of consistency in net? Um, you know, it's just uh, putting, in, putting in the work uh, prior to the games. Uh, I think that working closely with the guys in the back line, uh, forming those relationships with them. I think uh, that was, that's was that been crucial uh, this season in order to, to have those results. Speaking of the back line, after your match on Saturday, head coach Louis Bennett talked about the growth of your back line. He said the defense has really been able to edge teams out of having good opportunities. He mentioned the discipline. How have you seen your back line's discipline grow? Right, yeah, I mean, Towards the beginning of the season, we had a little bit of trouble there because uh, we had a relatively uh, new back line. Uh, but it was just a matter of forming those relationships and uh, just getting to know one another, each other's tendencies. And I think uh, we've been progressing uh, throughout the season. And you can see it in the last three games. We've given up uh, one goal in the last three games. So you can just see the, the results and the relationships there. How have you been working on that relationship with your back line? Uh, you know, just, uh, during practice, you know, we communicate a lot. I try to give, uh, the players in front of me as much as information as, uh, as I can, you know, uh, I'm a four year player for Marquette. I know all the, all the team's tendencies, all the, what the team requires from, from us. So just me communicating, communicating that to them. I think it's, it's, it's been crucial. You're also the Big East Goalkeeper of the Week. It's your second time being named the Big East Goalkeeper of the Week this season. The first was in Week 2. How has your game developed from Week 2 to now? Like I said, I think um, towards the beginning of the season, it, it was just like it was just me like making saves and stuff. But like I, like I said, I believe that the team has progressed uh, and we've uh, formed – uh, camaraderie and just more togetherness in the last I want to say four three four games uh, that have really helped us uh, keep clean sheets and just keep uh, keep th teams out of the back uh, of our net. Now you're tied right now in fourth place with St. John's and Xavier you take on the Musketeers this weekend what's coach Bennett's message to you guys heading into this weekend? Right yeah we always have the mentality of uh, our next game being the most important game for us. Uh, I think at this point, everything is on our hands um, in order to make it to the Big East tournament. Um, it's been, uh, since I've been here, we haven't made it to the tournament. So that's uh, w that was one of our, our big goals coming into the season, just uh, making it to the tournament and making it as far as we can go this season. Who do you mimic your game after? Uh, when I was little, I used to love Casillas uh, with reflexes and his saves, just making insane saves. I loved him. I loved him when I was little. Uh, most recently, I like uh, Hugo Lloris because uh, he's also pretty good with his feet and his reflexes are insanely good. So I, I try to mimic those, those two players there. I know your sister also played soccer, Daniela. She played at New Mexico State. When you were growing up, was she practicing target practice on you? Yeah, she uh, she was a she was a midfielder actually when 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 we were when she was younger obviously, um, and I would have her like shoot on me. We would go to the park. She would shoot on me, and uh, I, I would tell her I was like, if you can score on me, you can score. You shouldn't have any problem scoring on any anybody else. How often <laughs> was she able to get one by you? Uh, she would actually score a lot of goals on me. <laughs> <laughs> Friendly but, sibling rivalry, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Luis, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. That was a treat. Treat to listen to him, and he's such a, 
a key now in this home stretch. I really look at the last four for Marquette. I think that they have the most pivotal match of the weekend against Xavier, again, being locked in that fourth place tie. Because, Megan, after this match, they go to Creighton, mm -hmm. they go to Butler before hosting DePaul. Butler may be at the bottom of the standings, but that's still a really difficult road test at the Selleck Bowl. So you want to try to get three points this weekend and not have to be stuck doing it on the road because we know how hard that is in this conference. And I also have to point out that Luis came to the interview after having an exam earlier today. He left the interview with me That's went grinding. to another exam yeah. as well. So thank you, Luis. I hope you did well on your second exam. <laughs> it, it is grinding. The, the conference season is also a, a grind as well. And speaking of the grind that the women's soccer players have been going through, well, Georgetown is still at the top, 6-0. and oh, They are undefeated in conference play, John. And you have the Butler Bulldogs right behind them. What stands out to you the most here? St. John's and Villanova mm -hmm. squaring off on Thursday night in Queens. What a matchup that will be between Chris McLean's upstart Wildcats. This is a team that believes they can contend near the top of the conference. And St. John's has really been the story of conference play. They face a difficult non-conference slate. Ian Stone's team is peaking at the right time, and that all goes back to Zani Kajan. She's just absolutely incredible, John. She just continues to score and score for the Red Storm, and she's had 11 goals on the season, and it, it's just one of those things that they know to get the ball to her, and also when she's not open, she knows how to then continue to move the ball around to help out other people on her offense. Well, you know with St. John's that they're going to play pretty stout defense. They try to wear you down, but they're getting key goals. For this Villanova team, a bit of a, a strange occurrence for them this past weekend. They outshot Creighton by a wide amount. They felt like they outplayed the Blue Jays in a lot of ways, but they just couldn't come away with the result. And two straight shutout losses for them, certainly abnormal, because this team is powered by Bree Austin, who does a great job for what... Villanova looks to do offensively, and that's just the beginning of an offense that has featured 11 different goal scorers. So that sets up this matchup, Megan. Villanova and St. John's. You said it right there. You look at the you look at Bree Austin and you look at Zani Kajan. The question is, how are the respective defenses going to hold those two in this match? Well, I think for Villanova, they are going to go with a 4-3-3 look. Mm. So that's what the Wildcats like to do. You know that Ian Stone's going to uh, counter with a 4-4-2 in all likelihood. That's the way that the St. John's Red Storm has played through the years. I look at Villanova being the team that might be a little bit more feisty offensively. Talk about the 11 goal scores. They're a little bit more unpredictable. They're going to, to go right at St. John's. I mean, that's what they're going to do. I expect Villanova to try to man mark Zani Kajan to the best of their abilities. But the key thing is here, going to Belson Stadium, it's very hard to beat Ian Stone's mm -hmm. Red Storm team there. And I am intrigued to see where is the mindset in this Villanova team. Coming off two straight shutouts, they've had trouble putting the ball in the back of the net. St. John's isn't going to make it easy for you to do that. They always can give teams fits because of the way that they defend. So I wonder where Villanova's at. I think the key in this is Villanova's balanced offense against the St. John's team that is typically pretty stout in the back line. And who, who else is stout is the Butler women's soccer team as well. They're always. Having, always, right? They're second right now in the Big East standings, and you were out there, like we mentioned a little bit earlier, to talk to some of the players. Let's do it. The home stretch of Big East play coming along. You guys are right near the top of the conference. What's on this team's mind? You know, we're just really focused um, on the next practice, on the next game, and we really just want to improve each day. We're out on the field together, and we're just trying to keep that team um, community together, and our coaches are doing a really good job of emphasizing that. Let's look at Sunday's win over DePaul. You fall behind, but you find a way to win. Break down how that one went down. Yeah, so our coaches took us into the locker room at halftime. We're just like, this is a team battle. We're going to fight together to win this. We're going to come out on top because we want to come out on top, and we want it more than them. So it was just the mentality of just keep pushing forward. Don't worry about the goal. Just get the goal back, and then just keep uh, pushing forward to get that first goal and then that second goal and get momentum moving forward. It is a season that's now winding down here. Game's getting more and more crucial. You told me before we started that it's about winning out. Yeah. How exactly do you approach everything here? 
Um, we take it game by game. I would say Creighton being a big um, game in the season coming up this Thursday. We're just focusing on them. And then after that, we got Georgetown and Villanova, really big rivals. So I would say practicing hard, and we're really focusing on just game by game right now. What makes this program so successful? Um, the competitiveness. Every practice we come in hard. Everyone's um, practicing hard. We're all competing for our spots and uh, makes everyone better. So I would say competitiveness. This week, Creighton coming in and then Georgetown this upcoming weekend. I know it's a game by game approach, but can you speak to what it's like to go up against La Jolla's? You two have been at the top of this league these last few years. Yeah, of course. Um, our main focus is really on Creighton right now. Obviously, our coaches do a really good job of focusing um, one game at a time. But Georgetown is a phenomenal t phenomenal team, just like Creighton's a phenomenal team. So we kind of just look at every single team um, just like they're 11 girls on the field and we're playing against them and we just have that focus in our mind and like I said Georgetown's an amazing team and we respect them for that but like we're just going to go out and compete like we always do. Defensively there's a backbone also with you guys. Uh, how much is that going to play an importance here as you go down the wire in the season? Um, defensively I would say helps us a lot. We have really big standouts. We have Julia Leonard and Annika Schmidt who are really big in our back line who tell us like what to do up front and they like really move us into our block and I think that would help us out throughout the game big time. All right who's the funniest player on the team? Oh JC Helmer uh, my roommate absolutely funniest person I've ever met in my life she keeps me going I'm not gonna lie. You gotta share a story. Okay so we every before before every game we'll like She'll get me pumped up. She'll be like, okay, Anya, let's grab something. And she'll like grab everything. She'll be like, hand me something. So she has this ball and she's like crumbling it up. And then she'll throw it up and I'll be like, oh no, where'd it go? And then I'll grab it and we'll just, yeah, and the whole team will just go crazy. So she's funny. She cracks some jokes too. Favorite soccer player to watch? Who? My favorite soccer player, actually I have two. So I love Lindsey Horan and I love Julie Ertz. I really like their like strength mentality and they just are fighters on the field. They're go-getters and honestly, every, every single time I watch them play, they're just fun to watch and they always want to win. And that's just a mentality that I have in the back of my mind always. Any pregame routines? Oh gosh, that's a fun question for me. Um, my pregame routines um, start a good 48 hours before I play. Wow. I'm really religious about what I do. I like to be in the mindset. I like to visualize myself on the field, and I visualize a perfect game for me, a perfect game for my team and my teammates. I eat the same thing. Um, I eat a sweet potato, quinoa, and chicken before each game. I know it's crazy. I, I just get, like, super specific about what I want to do because um, I like to be in my mojo before the game, 48 hours, and um, I really – take it upon myself to be as prepared as I can be for myself and for my teammates. Um, let's go rapid fire here. Favorite music? Post Malone. Pop. Yeah, hip hop pop. Favorite thing to watch on Netflix or Amazon? Uh, friends. Halloween's coming up. Best costume that Anya Savage has worn? Ooh, Katy Perry. I was Katy Perry for one, for one Halloween. at the full on thing. What exactly were you wearing? Uh, she, uh, it was a costume with like a bunch of ice cream sticking out. It was a dress with like poofy colors and I had a purple wig on with a headband. It was, it was fun. <laughs> Anya Savage, thanks for your time. Good luck. No, no, thank you. Thank you so much. The Bulldogs finish out their season with both contests on the road this weekend, John, a really tough task that they have. No doubt about it, and I'm intrigued to see what happens this weekend on Sunday. Shaw Field, Butler, and Georgetown, so much on the line in that showdown. We know that the dogs can get it done defensively, but they've changed up their formation, Megan, so I'm intrigued to see if that can pay off for some sort of breakthrough against Georgetown's back line. They've got to find something. The problem is Georgetown... They cause so many issues because they've got like five, six forwards that just are nightmares mm -hmm. to defend. I don't know how you do it. We'll see if the dogs can find an answer. We will see. And what stood out to me the most in that interview, too, is when Anya was saying they're always competing in practice. They always have that high level of competition with one another so that they are able to game day come out and prove it to who they're going against. That's the culture of the program. That's the culture that Terry St. John and Rob Allman have established with the Butler Bulldogs. Two cultures that have also been very well established are Creighton and Marquette Volleyball. <laughs> we, we talked about them last week. We're talking about these two teams again this week because, again, John, they're at the top 
of the Big East standings. Well, and again, they can be playing into de December, deep into December, in the NCAA volleyball tournament. I mean, th that's what these two teams can do. They can make big time runs. I wouldn't be surprised by either one of them being in the Elite Eight, maybe even the Final Four. Creighton's got that type of makeup. We saw it in that sweep over Marquette earlier this year. We know that they are going to meet up in Milwaukee coming up, but the Jays went into Georgetown against the Hoyas, an upstart Hoyas team, and they pretty much silenced all that talk, and Creighton took care of business inside McDonough Gym. And Creighton always knows that teams are coming in looking to give them their best. They want to pull off the upset. Head coach Kirsten Bernthal Booth said that, and she said that her team did, did better responding to teams punching against them, as she put it. So they always know they've got that target on their back. How do we respond week after week? That's the biggest part of it. It's not really a talent on paper type of thing with Creighton. It's just mentality. And for Marquette, look, you're the hunted constantly. It just comes down to how you handle that mentally, and they did just that. That's what they've done throughout this season. And they have the Defensive Player of the Week in Martha Kanavadov. We talk about all the outside hitting, but for me, Kanavadov will be the key if Marquette's going to surpass Creighton because the sophomore libero has stepped up for the Golden Eagles throughout the season. They're going to need her in the bigger matches this season. And, John, this weekend marked Marquette's seventh consecutive sweep. And that didn't come Goodness. without adversity, right? It's just, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. it, we talk about these two teams. I, I almost think that if you tune into this update every week, it, it sounds like a broken record. But, folks, Creighton and Marquette are in all likelihood going to meet for the Big East volleyball title deep into November at DJ Sokol Arena. It's going to be on FS2. It'll be Saturday, November the 24th. Mm -hmm. You have got to watch that. If you have ever watched college volleyball, you're going to see some of the best that the sport has to offer in that matchup. It's an NCAA tournament type showdown for the Big East title. In Olympic sports in the Big East Conference, it does not get better than that. Creighton and Marquette are setting the standard in this league and have grown into quite the rivalry. Oh, definitely. And one of the things that I loved after this past weekend, Marquette head coach Ryan Tice said that his team faced a lot of adversity and the fact that they had a uh, reschedule, they had delayed flights, and they were still able to pull off the sweep, which was pretty incredible. Well, here's everything you need to know about Creighton and Marquette, <laughs> what you could have. And it's not going to happen this year. I'm going to say it right here on set. Last year they played so long that they ran out of TV time for the, for the <laughs> darn game because they played so long. I mean, that's the kind of game it was. I see it going five sets again this year and being epic, and, and this time they'll have enough in the window. Oh, definitely. And <laughs> let's take a look at what we have coming up first this weekend before we look at that matchup that we are still so excited to have. John, with some of the key upcoming games, we mentioned the men's soccer, women's soccer, what you're looking forward to. What other games are you looking forward to here? Well, Georgetown and St. John's are the two teams in Big East Volleyball that go uh, beyond Creighton and Marquette, the two teams that are right there in contention to make the conference tournament. So that's an intriguing Saturday evening showdown between the Hoyas and the Red Storm in Queens. I also am intrigued to see Providence and DePaul in women's soccer because both those teams are trying to make the tournament. And you've got DePaul's high-powered offense against a Providence team. It's very good at stifling teams defensively. It's going to be really exciting to see how this plays out with women's soccer coming to the close this weekend with just how important we, we stressed it all season, those three points. And now, really, when teams are looking to get a spot in the tournament, these three points are all the more important. Yeah, it all starts tomorrow night. Three matches in one week for these women's soccer teams. Uh, the season concluding on October the 25th, the same day as Big East Media Day. It'll be a busy day around the Big East Conference as we hit the home stretch. I'm excited for it. And, John, you're on the call for Villanova women's soccer this game this week? Catch it tomorrow on the Big East Digital Network. Use the Fox Sports app, 7 Eastern time, St. John's, Villanova. It will be a big-time showdown. Something's got to give. Be sure to tune in and watch John there, and we'll see you guys next week on the next episode of the Big East Fall Sports Update. For John Fanta, Megan Caffrey, thank you for tuning in.